have a good number of folks and joining us. So we go ahead and get started to respect everyone's time. My name is Monica Gonzalez. I'm the Digital Equity Supervisor at Methodist Healthcare Ministries. And I'm proud to turn it over to our partner, Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I told him earlier, this is the webinar that I've been looking forward to all year long that I didn't even know we needed. So I really appreciate them taking on this endeavor of helping us understand maps. So I will pass it on to Christine. Thank you, Monica, and thank you everyone for being here today and uh, hear me gush about maps. Um, I'm the senior JS analyst at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and so maps are something I think and talk and make all the time. Um, and I thought we'd start with a little sort of icebreaker um, and make our own map. And so in this activity, you'll notice you all have, you should have a cursor. If it shows up as a hand initially, if you go over to the left over here on your screen, there's a little arrow at the top. If you click that, it'll give you a selector. And what I'd like you to do on the left-hand side there, you'll see some little different colored people. Just pick one and right click and hit duplicate. And then, select and drag your copied person if you're in Texas, where you are in Texas. Otherwise, if you're tuning in from outside Texas, put it on the state you're tuning in from. And you can resize them if you want. <laughs> and then we can, I feel like um, I often, you know, you see questions in the chat about where people are tuning in from, but they always go through so fast and I never actually get a sense of where people are coming from. So I thought this would be a different way to go about it. And it's a mapping webinar after all. And it's cool to see folks coming from other parts of the country too. Oh, and I am so sorry. I am realizing now uh, Alaska and Hawaii, I apologize if you are on this call. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't tag you guys on there. I'm really sorry. Give it another minute. Looks like we've got some West Texas, lots in like Central South Texas. And a smattering of folks from elsewhere. Very cool. Welcome, welcome. All right, I don't see any new little people showing up. So I'm gonna, let's see, switch screens here. We'll close our whiteboard. And then I'm going to share my screen and we'll get the presentation going. All right. Pardon me while I just get this, get all these screens arranged. There we go. All right, um, if you like QR codes, you can scan this one at the bottom there uh, and it'll give you access to this presentation. So if you wanna have it later, if you wanted to look at it yourself um, on your phone or something or get the links immediately, you, you have it there. All right, so we did our little map activity and I just wanted to give you a layout for what we're gonna cover today with the ultimate goal of me proving that your community can participate in the bead process. It is possible and I'm hoping to give folks the, the information and suggestions and advice for being able to do that. And we're gonna start out with a quick primer on the FCC map. Um, and can I get a show of hands or maybe even in the chat of folks, if you've interacted with this map, the FCC National Broadband Map, that's what's featured here. You can use the hand raise or, okay, cool. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Great, awesome. Um, so we're gonna head over there, oops. Pardon me, this is 
should be a link. But it's not working for me. That's okay. I have this one on a bookmark, so it is always available. Okay, so this is the map, the default landing page. Um, just a quick kind of layout, lay of the land here. Um, there are th these first three tabs cover like different ways you can approach this map. The first is a location level. This is probably the one folks most frequently use to check what's available at your address. Others are uh, provider-based summary and area or a geography-based summary. So you could put in a county, state, um, and there's a few other types of geographies. Um, today, we're really gonna focus on this location level summary. And I'll also talk about this download tab a little bit before we move on to our next topic. So um, in the location summary, um, when you click on it, you'll notice immediately the entire country appears to be served, right? If we're looking at this map legend over here, the dark blue indicates 80 to 100% served. Um, that sounds a little bit crazy, am I right? <laughs> Um, and this is because the default view of this map, um, and any uh, any view, anytime you're looking at this map, it is defined by these service filters. So this gray bar here at the top of the map is determining what is considered served in the map. And so by clicking on this button, we can see what the different setting options are. Currently, it's set at 100 over 20, which is what we're actually going, what we want to have set up currently. Um, because uh, as it pertains to bead, NTA is defined a, a reliable high-speed internet connection as one that is of at least 100 over 20 megabits per second um, served via a wired licensed fixed wireless internet connection. Currently, it's set at any technology. So if we change this, you will see immediately a big widespread change. Um, we're also focusing on residential service. You can look at business, but um, what we're focusing today is residential. And so there's a much more realistic view happening here. It's still probably not perfect. If you're honing in on an area where you live, it may still look like kind of an exaggeration, um, but we're not going to worry about it at this overarching, this high level view. Um, we want to get down to the location level. That's what we're doing in this tab. Um, and you might notice if you've ever played with this before, it feels like you're zooming forever. I want you to pay attention to this left, lower left-hand corner. I'm at zoom level seven right now. If you keep watching, it's going to take a while. You have to get down to zoom level 15 to see the locations. So that is something to keep in mind. I know I, I've heard some people get a little confused or dissuaded um, when they're playing around in this tab that they don't, they can't find the locations. And that's because you just have to zoom for a while. The other way to do it is to search by address. So if we go back to this default, we can put in an address. You can put in like a specific street address or um, you can start to type in and you can just go by town or like a city and it'll bring you to that area. So um, you don't have to be super specific when you're doing this. Now, um, if we switch back, if, if, we didn't, if we didn't change this technology view, if we're looking at this, this town, Wells, Texas, does anyone know where Wells, Texas is by chance? <laughs> Maybe not. I, I honestly don't really know where it is, um, but it was a random town I found <laughs> to use for this example. So again, looking at any technology, this this would, map would indicate that the whole town is well served. Um, the legend down here is showing us green dots indicate coverage is available, red circles are not available. But if we change it back to our definition of served, the picture is very different. So most of this town is um, 
I'm going to say unserved or underserved because with our speed definition here, this could be either category. So if it were unserved, if we wanted to just see the unserved locations, we would change it down to 25 over three and that filters it even more. Um, it does increase the number of locations that appear served. Um, so the ones that are not appearing served here have even less available essentially. Um, so that is the service filter. One of the most probably important things to know about this map. Um, when you click on a location, it's gonna over in the right hand panel here, it's gonna pop up the different providers that claim to be able to provide service. Um, it also gives you whether or not it gives you like the service status. Um, and again, this this status is based off of this filter. Um, so as you're playing around with this map, if you happen to switch tabs and go back to a place, keep an eye on that filter. Sometimes it will switch back to the default view um, and uh, can be just a little bit confusing. So it's something to keep an eye on. Um, other really important features to be aware of in here um, is this layer toggle button. It looks like a, I don't know, a s'more. It's summer, so I'm thinking about s'mores a lot. Um, and here you can view challenge data. Um, you can turn these on individually, um, and then you'll notice these layers also get added to our map legend. So I'm not seeing any yellow dots, which would be availability challenges, um, but plenty of missing locations have been challenged here. And so that means um, that a location didn't appear in the map and someone clicked there and submitted a missing location challenge. Um, and then other location challenges, looks like we have a couple. So that means that something about the, the place information there was incorrect, whether it was the address or the, the placement of the dot itself, and maybe it was on someone's garage instead of their house, um, that is generally what those are indicating. So um, kind of cool. You can see you know where, where challenges are happening um, and look for any patterns there. And this is something I'm going to refer back to later on in, in this webinar. Um, another nice feature um, while we're here is you can turn on the satellite view. So if you are looking to like confirm whether a location is actually a location versus like a barn or I don't know, a tent or a silo, green silo, um, you can turn on the satellite view and get a much better picture of you know what these dots are sitting on. Sometimes it's a little blurry, but um, it's a, it gives you a much better idea than the like black and white view. All right. Um, now the last thing I wanted to touch on on this website was the data download page. Um, I could spend a whole webinar honestly talking about the data aspect of things, um, but I want to kind of hit the main points as it pertains to kind of uh, understanding how to get these data and then as it pertains to beads. So, um, Okay, so there are a couple, similarly to the general map interface, there are a few different ways you can download data. Um, and this is the location level data that is shown in this map. So you can do it by state or by provider. Um, say we're doing it by state, you then pick the version of the map you wanna work with, um, December 31st of 2023, that is the most recent. Then you pick your state since we're talking about Texas. And down here, uh, you'll get a list of different spreadsheets you can download. So each one of these spreadsheets contains all of, for example, in cable, for a given location, it includes every single um, provider that claims to offer cable internet service at that location. And so that's for all locations across Texas. And so that, also applies to all of these different technology types. And you would need to, to be able to visualize internet availability claims across Texas, you would need to download all of these files. And that would give you like the full picture of what, the same picture essentially that's being displayed 
and the national broadband map. Now I know there's a lot of confusion about um, working with the broadband data and especially because there's uh, a lot of talk about the, the fabric license. Um, if you're not familiar, the fabric is a location level data set. It's essentially like the address book that is um, supporting this map. So all those locations, um, the address itself, the latitude, longitude, which creates that point on the map, um, the unit count, the location type are all part of this fabric that are created by a company called CostQuest. Um, and because that is their proprietary data product, um, if you are trying to do any sort of location level mapping or um, analysis that would include any of those pieces of data, uh, you do have to execute a license agreement with CostQuest. It's free to do. Um, However, um, it's in most cases, it's it's unlikely that you actually need it because we can do a lot with the public data set that is provided here. It's not to say it could, you know, it couldn't be better, but we can do a lot. So um, the in the past uh, broadband maps, we've had mapping at the census block level. And th that had its issues, you know, it was hard to know the extent to which a given census block was served by a provider because it only required one location in the block to be served for the whole block to appear served. In this situation now, because each, each record in these, um, or each row in these spreadsheets is related to a location, it also includes the census block information that that location is falls into. So you can map and illustrate the percentage of locations in a census block that are served or unserved or underserved. So you can you can get an idea of the level of service across Texas at the census block level, which is really good. Um, and, you know, more detailed than we've ever really been able to look at before. Uh, and so you can you can do this without a license. You don't need it. There's no no restrictions on how you use these data. This is a public data set. So I want to really re reiterate that to people. Um, you don't need any special license to use these data. They're right here. You can download them anytime. Um, likewise, we can also now download the challenge data. So those those extra layers that I showed that we toggled on. Um, those are also available. And so there's uh, a number of like, they're chunked out into dates essentially, um, as well as the type of challenge. So there are fabric challenges, which are in progress because uh, they just revised the, the overarching fabric. Um, but what I think will be most important to focus on for bead are looking at the resolved challenges. Um, and even some of the in-progress ones could be helpful, but I think looking at the uh, resolved challenges will be most helpful. And I'll talk more about that later, but those are available here to download. All right, um, I'm gonna hop back over to my presentation window. Where did it go? There it is, all right. And just to give you, uh, for anyone that hasn't looked at one of these spreadsheets before, this is just a glimpse of the kinds of data that are included in them. Um, and so this one uh, is a, I think this is a satellite provider. Um, so, you know, some kind of detailed information, the, their uh, FCC registration number, their provider ID number, the brand name, the location ID, so here you can see these are individual, well, there's a few repeats here because they're offering different levels of service, but these are individual locations. Um, this technology, this is a code indicating the, the type of infrastructure that the service is delivered over. So it could be fiber, cable, um, DSL, fixed wireless. Um, and then our maximum advertised download upload speeds. So these aren't measures of reliability or quality or anything. This is just what the provider is claiming to be able to provide there. Um, indication of whether this is a low latency connection. Um, 
whether it's a business or residential service offering the state, the census block, which I mentioned. Um, it also includes this hexagon um, ID number, which is like the view that you're getting when you zoom out, when you're not a location view, it's giving you those um, hexagons. Um, this ID isn't 100% uh, useful uh, in terms of creating summaries. So I don't recommend working with this necessarily, um, but kind of beyond the scope of what we're gonna talk about today. So this is what you get when you are downloading data from the broadband data collection, which uh, is visualized in the national broadband map. So that is the, the big map. Um, next, we're going to focus on um, juggling all the different kinds of challenges out there. Um, and I really want to drive home the point that the FCC challenges that have been going on for some time now are not the same. Um, and it's a very different process from the bead challenge process. And um, But before we get into that, um, I just wanted to take a quick pause and check in with folks. How are we doing? Do we have any questions so far? You can... Great question. Oh my goodness. Broadband equity access and oh. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jess. <laughs> I'm not great with the on the spot acronyms, forgive me. <laughs> All right. Um, Mark, uh, that is a good question. I believe. From what I've seen, the location challenges are cumulative. Um, I don't, I don't recall if the availability challenges are. I I know they have a a field in when you're looking at the map and you click on a location. Each there's a, now a, a challenge column next to the providers, uh, and I think that is supposed to indicate if there's a challenge against that provider at that location. Um, I, th I think they're still showing up in the map, but I'm not sure if, if I don't, th I feel like with the availability challenges, if they haven't been resolved yet, they show up, but if they have been resolved, they are not. Um, I am not hundred percent sure on that though. I can, I can double check unless someone else in, in here has a for sure answer. Uh, let's see, main advantage to having tier U license to provide slot long fields. Um, that is an advantage. Um, I will I will make a note and bring that up later when we talk about fabric things. Because that is relevant to, to a section later. All right. Okay, so talking about these challenges. So first I wanted to talk about the FCC challenge process. So in the national broadband map, there are uh, two buckets of challenges. So one is the location challenges. Um, and so that, and I think I, I mentioned this a little bit, but it is related to the location itself. So the address, the placement of that dot on the map, um, uh, whether or not your location has a dot on the map, um, the unit count. So if, if you're in an apartment building, is the unit count accurate? Um, all of those pieces of information are challengeable. Um, and those are called location challenges. And so those um, are managed by CostQuest, who manages the, the bigger location data set, which is the fabric. And those are... Um, those types of challenges anyone can participate in. So you can, you know, if you see that your neighbor's dot is on their garage instead of on their house, you could submit a challenge. I did that for my mom actually. Um, so those you can do anywhere uh, for anyone. Um, those look the the location challenges though are not continuously getting updated in the map. 
Um, so twice a year, uh, providers are asked to submit data to the FCC to update this map. So we have two major updates for the national broadband map a year. And now um, kind of in sync with that, we also have two major updates, well, two updates to the fabric each year. So before um, at the beginning of the year and kind of the end of the year, middle of the year, sorry, getting confused. Um, anyway, providers, internet service providers are given an updated version of the fabric over which they uh, uh, overlay their service territory and identify which locations they um, claim to be able to offer service to. Um, and so uh, those, those, that's part of the reason why the, the fabric is not getting continuously updated. Um, and then the availability challenges, which is related to the internet service side of things, those are accepted and incorporated on a rolling basis. So um, those challenges are um, sent to the provider and then there's kind of a, a complicated timeline, which I also have a, a guide that um, if folks are interested in, in digging more into this, they can check that out. Um, but uh, once those are resolved and either upheld or um, otherwise, they get in incorporated into the map. And so between these major map updates, there are also two week updates that occur. Um, so every two weeks, if there are uh, resolved availability challenges, they can get incorporated. Um, the one caveat with the availability challenges in terms of who can submit them is that um, individuals, um, while individuals, everyone can participate. So it's, you know, ISPs, governments, um, nonprofit orgs, individual citizens um, with availability challenges, individuals cannot submit an availability challenges for someone else's house. Like, for example, my mom, if if she was complaining to me that, you know, she looked in this map and saw that, for example, Spectrum claimed to offer fiber at her house. And then when she requested it, it actually wasn't available. I can't submit that challenge for her, but she could do that. But I cannot because I don't, I don't live at her house or ha have the authority um, in that position to submit it. There's some legalese in these um, availability forms um, that, uh, ask you if you are, are that person. So something to just be aware of. And so, um, and I talked a little bit about these timelines. Um, this is something that the FCC uh, updates uh, somewhat regularly on their website. I think it's on the BDC website, Broadband Data Collection for short. Um, and so it gives you some idea of when, um, especially if you're interested in, in getting locations added to the FCC map, um, it gives you an idea of when you would wanna get that finished by or submitted by so that it could get included in, in, in the next update. Um, this also gives you an idea of when those versions will be released and, and things like that. So kind of a nice timeline to have handy. Now, bead challenges are a separate separate process that are happening. It's a discrete one-time thing. Um, and one major difference is that there are no location challenges happening. So if a location does not exist in the challenge portal that Texas sets up, then that is not a location that is that you can challenge the avail availability on. So it won't uh, be in the... Uh, official like universe of locations in the bead process. That doesn't, that isn't to say that it couldn't get incorporated into a build project, um, but it, it wouldn't be officially eligible for bead funding in this way. Um, and also um, the, the folks that are eligible to participate in the challenge are also more limited. So only ISPs, nonprofits, tribal governments, and local governments can participate in the bead process. Um, we've seen in other states, uh, some nonprofits and states have set up something like a sister portal to, the ch to their challenge portal, which does allow individuals to submit challenges. And from that, that 
challenge data that is submitted, eligible challengers can go in and use that to submit challenges on their behalf. Um, whether or not that will happen in Texas yet is um, something we're waiting to hear on. I know there is interest in it, but they are still um, working out who the vendor will be. And so that will kind of determine um, what's possible. Um, also this, uh, this process, um, unlike the FCC process, this is a much shorter and discrete window. So um, it's a 14 day window for the, the challenge process itself. Um, and that is starting, I believe it's slated for mid July. And then there'll be, after that, there'll be like a, I think it's a two week review period followed by a two week rebuttal period. And then there's um, more curing and um, resolving the all the evidence. Uh, so it's a much more discrete period, but um, very impactful, specific to Texas. And so how do these, I think, you know, maybe a big question that folks have been wondering is like, how are these maps like related exactly? And so Texas has shared that they are going to use version four of the map of the FCC map, which was just released uh, like a couple weeks ago. Um, and they are going to include any updates that occur, those minor updates I mentioned, any updates through July 1st. Um, and that will be their universe of locations to start with. There is a step um, between the FCC map and getting it into the challenge portal, which is called deduplication. Uh, so every state has to take the FCC locations, their service status, and then look at where funding has been received to build infrastructure. And those locations um, will be considered served as um, enforceable commitments. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. All right, that was a lot. another big chunk of information. How are we doing? Do we have more questions? <laughs> yes, uh, when, when the fabric product was initially released, I often went to, I don't know if anyone remembers this, I often went to the um, cotton commercial, like the fabric of our lives. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Okay, well, if you do have questions, um, we're going to take a five minute break. So uh, we'll come back at See, for me, it's it'll be 3.40. So I think for Central Time folks, it'll be 2.40. Um, and yeah, but in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free, put them in the chat or you can come off mute. But we'll take a quick break. Next up, we're gonna start digging into the bead challenge process specifically. I don't know if anyone else hears challenge um, and is immediately confused and wondering which, <laughs> since there are, I mean, there are just so many and then there's like challenge types within each and it's wild. So um, I recognize that it's kind of an overwhelming thing. So I'm gonna try and take this uh, a kind of stepwise approach to working through the different details. And some of this may be like a little bit redundant and reiterating things I've said earlier, but, I feel like it just can't hurt. Bead is relatively pretty complicated and there's so much information. And I, as of earlier this afternoon was still learning new things about it. So um, we're, all, we're all in this together and uh, we'll do our best to get through this topic. So again, who can challenge? And this is again, the, we're focused here on the Texas bead challenge process. And so local governments, ISPs, tribes, nonprofit orgs. Those are the what are defined as the eligible entities. Um, what can be challenged? I, I touched on this a little bit and I'm going to get into more detail on the next slide, but generally it's focused on availability. Uh, so if, if folks can actually get the service at their location. Um, there's also, uh, kind of like funding related uh, challenges in terms of availability. 
uh, which I, I think I mentioned enforceable commitments, but if, a, if an ISP has received funding to build to specific locations, um, those are things that are challengeable in the bead challenge process. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into all the different varieties of challenges uh, in the next slide. And when should folks be preparing to, if, the, if you might want to participate in the challenge process? So I, you know, I would say now, if you if you haven't already thought about it, um, and and maybe you're feeling more confident, hopefully by the end of today or this webinar, rather, um, you know, as soon as you have time to prepare, um, you know, you have now that uh, the FCC the version four is out, that is a very close link to what will be in the Texas Challenge Portal. Remember, there will be some changes to location statuses because of the deduplication process. There's some funding out. You can also um, check out what federal funding uh, is available. And I maybe one of my teammates can put the link in the chat for me to the FCC funding map. Um, it's kind of like the sister map to the, the broadband availability map. And it has a lot of the same information, but it also includes whether a location has received federal funding for infrastructure. So that can be a really helpful guide for understanding if locations have also received funding. So if you determine a location might be eligible with you know the technology and speed settings we looked at, you can also go to this other map and determine whether or not it's received prior funding. If it has, it may not be eligible for bead funding. Um, let's see. So um, where are thank you, Dan? Where are challenges submitted? So they will be submitted. Uh, Texas is uh, working on getting a portal vendor. So they will create a challenge portal. If you've not looked, um, other states uh, have these portals available. You can kind of check them out. Um, but it's essentially a map and uh, they do vary in terms of like how they're laid out. But it will be that will be the uh, place that you'll go to challenge the map. Uh, it sounds like Texas will be accepting both challenges. Um, and whether or not they're accepting individual challenges um, will all again depend on who the vendor is. Um, uh, what else? What else? Uh, and why? Why should we be participating? Um, if if you're maybe new to this space, um, three point three billion dollars is what Texas received in the bead allocation. So that's a pretty big reason. Um, and so this is also this process itself is kind of the last one of the big last steps in terms of allocating those dollars across Texas. So uh, if your location is not deemed eligible um, during this process, it's not eligible for funding to have infrastructure built to it. So it's very important in get, ensuring that we get uh, internet infrastructure built across the state. Can I expand on area challenges? Uh, absolutely. So uh, an area challenge is a situation where within a census block group, uh, which is like, uh, it's a geography that's, I, I guess in my mind, it's smaller like, than a county, um, generally speaking. Um, and if six challenges are submitted within that area against the same provider for the same technology, for the same type of reason, um, then that whole census block group would automatically be challenged. And that provider would then have to demonstrate that they can serve, I think at least, I think the rule is like at least 80% of the locations within that census block group. So it's, it's a really cool strategy that puts the burden of proof on providers to demonstrate that they can serve those areas. Uh, Texas is not using an area challenge. They're also not uh, using MDU challenges, which is a multiple dwelling unit. And it's a sort of a similar strategy wherein uh, you you would only need, I think, 10%. Um, and I feel like the rules on that might have changed. So if someone 
remembers that differently, please correct me. Uh, but I think you only needed to get 10% of a unit count uh, challenged in order for the whole building to be challenged. Um, and so in, in a similar situation, the provider would be required to demonstrate that they can serve that, that whole building. Um, so Texas isn't um, utilizing either of those processes. Thank you, Jess. Through a survey, can you say more about that question? Yeah, um, I was just going to use my myself um, as an example by saying that um, for my house and a property, um, my family and I have, <clears throat> um, I had to get surveyed in order to actually get internet to the physical address. Um, in both situations, they were uh, they gave me the same answer. Um, if I was just a few feet further, then I wouldn't be able to. And I, and if I wanted to get it. I would have had to pay like, you know, thousands of dollars. Yes. Yes. So that actually is a good segue for our next digging into the challenge types. Um, so that that would fall under our availability type challenge. Uh, because if if uh if a standard installation is not available at your location, which include which means that a provider would have to schedule an installation within 10 days of your request and not charge a fee beyond their standard installation fee. Um, then if, if they can't meet those qualifications, then it is not a standard installation and it is a challengeable situation. I hope that uh, answers your question, Adam. Um, other uh, situations that fall in availability are if, you know, in the, what will be the Texas um, map, if it says service is available, um, but actually if you were to request it from the provider and you like through their, a lot of them have um, like a web-based request. Um, if it says, actually, we don't offer service there yet, you can take a screenshot of that. And that is, um, that is a, a challengeable situation. Now, um, while you can you can collect that information, um, it's not clear yet how individuals would share that challenge information. So, um, and that kind of gets into the challenge strategy thing. So I'll save that part. Um, so other challenges here, um, data cap. So if the only service plan that is available to you has a data, data cap, so meaning um, you can't use more than in this, I think it's defined as 600 gigabits monthly and any alternative plans can't be a business service, a business level service. Um, and that's really your only option, then that is um, challengeable. Um, so it, it would be not considered as served. And so your location would be made eligible if that were confirmed. Um, some other like availability kind of type challenges include um, technology. Um, and this one is pretty tricky, to be honest. Um, so in order for, uh, this is a, a situation where the provider claims to offer service via a particular kind of uh, infrastructure. So they might claim to offer service via a fiber connection. So they have like a wire coming into your house, but maybe you're actually only getting fixed wireless. So you're, it, it's almost like a, a Wi-Fi signal coming into your house instead. Um, that is challengeable. Um, the catch here is that the evidence that is suggested to provide is uh, like some specific, like your modem, number, registration number, I think, and another ID, like there's a couple ID numbers that you would be asked to provide, which is really specific. And I feel like, you know, as someone who knows a lot about what's going on with this program and a lot in this space, like it was kind of tricky for me to understand. So I, and from what I've heard, this particular challenge isn't getting used a whole lot um, because it's inherently technical. <laughs> Um, another, uh, kind of availability, uh, related challenge are the business service only. So this is a case where 
the plans are being marketed or, or only available to businesses rather than residential locations. Um, and so that would be uh, another option. Uh, these other, oh, let's see. Then we have some that are more related to like funding and ISP endeavors, I guess. Um, so enforceable commitment, I think I mentioned before, if an ISP has received support from a previous funding program, um, so they, they uh, those locations will be considered served and it's kind of like a pending, pending served situation. They haven't built it yet, but they have been funded to do so. Um, and they have the external deadline imposed by that particular funding program. Um, it can also be challenged in the other way that it's not part of an enforceable commitment. Um, then we have plan service. This is uh, a situation where an a service internet service provider is planning to maybe upgrade or build service to an area. Um, the uh, because there's no external deadline imposed because it's unrelated to a grant or some other like funding program, um, the Texas uh, Broadband Office has see, has defined it as uh, a deadline of November 30th. So anything that falls into this category of plan service um, will have to be built um, by November 30th. Um, Kind of relatedly with another um, deadline are these escalating service commitments. Um, so this one is uh, kind of related to the enforceable commitment. So a provider might have received um, funding from a, a or support from a previous uh, funding program, and it may not have required the same level of service that bead is imposing. So that 100 over 20 and wireline and fixed wireless type service, if, if, it, if the requirements for that program were less, the provider can say, well, we'll meet the bead requirements um, and please consider this, if you consider this location to be served. At so meaning that like they they still get to keep that location served so someone else isn't able to bid on it. Um, there is a deadline on that one. And so those locations that fall into this category would have to be built out by December 31st of this year. Um, so lots of different ways um, that locations and their service levels can be challenged here. Let's see, I see your question, Adam. If I had to pay for getting that line laid. Um, it sounds like your location may, I mean, may be eligible um, without knowing what else is technically offered there. Um, I'm not sure. Um, also, I, I think there are some uh, restrictions on who can apply for bead funding. Um, but yeah, I guess I don't, I don't have enough information to know how to best answer that question. Yes. Thank you, Chris. All right. Um, all right. So, we have learned a lot of things. There are still a lot of things that we don't know. And I wanted to just kind of rehash some things and also give you pointers about who to ask about, you know, various things. Um, so we know the types of permissible challenges, um, generally availability, funding, that kind of thing. Um, Texas is not implementing any pre-challenge modifications. Um, if you've paid attention in other states, there are some, in addition to the deduplication process where they take any funded locations um, and consider those served. Uh, Texas is like not, they've decided not to implement any other kind of widespread alterations. Um, so that makes, that makes this participation in this pro 
per, uh, process even more valuable and important. Um, and like I mentioned also, they're also not implementing the area and MDU challenges. So every challenge that gets submitted is even more valuable because we're not able to get those larger geographies automatically challenged. Um, we have the timeline and I um, have this on the next slide so folks can check it out. Um, the fabric license is recommended. Um, it may be required. Um, that's still something um, that they're working out, uh, whether or not, if you're just going to be challenging and rebutting, whether or not you actually need it. Um, if you're planning to actually apply for bead funding though, uh, you will be required to get a fabric license in order for you to manage the application and also the grant. Um, no, we don't know yet who the challenge portal vendor is. So Texas is still um, interviewing and working that out. Um, and so that will determine whether um, whether the state will be hosting like a, a separate portal for individual level challenges to be shared. Um, and it also determine um, that fabric license requirement for participating in the challenge process. So um, some things that we're kind of waiting to see. And here is the challenge process timeline. And so this is something, um, the dates I pulled out of the text, but this you can find in Texas's um, volume one of their bead initial proposal. And I have this linked also um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so if you'd like to check that out. And honestly, a lot of the information specific to Texas is pulled out of that, that volume. Um, their, their office is also very um, quick to communicate about any questions that you have, um, so feel free to reach out to them. Um, and let's see. Okay, any more questions as we're going along? I see a little bit more in the chat. Okay. Mark, that is a very good question. And that was one I thought of this afternoon and didn't have a chance to email Texas and get an answer before this. So um, it is on my, my I have a, an, an email draft ready for them. So um, I'm happy to to report back about what I, what I find out because it's, yeah, that was, I wasn't sure if, if they if those locations would immediately become eligible um or or what will happen um so that i'll have to dig into it's a good question um any other states i am not sure um i know I know there's a good amount of variation in how long these processes are lasting. Um, I think some are often longer because they are implementing um, and allowing speed test submissions, um, which uh, in order for those to be uh, accepted, folks have to submit, uh, repeat the test three days in a row. So I think they're trying to give folks as much time as possible to be able to accomplish that and, and get them submitted. But um, I don't know, uh, maybe Jess is also very um, in touch with all things bead, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it is short. So um, like I like I said before, I think, you know, the more folks can start to prepare now, um, I think the more effective you can be in participating when the when the challenge process does get started up. All right, so now we'll head on. Oh gosh, I just noticed the time. Um, I apologize, I've gone a little bit over and this is the last section. Um, so I will be quick. Um, and this is being recorded, so if anyone has to hop, I completely understand. Um, I apologize for running over time. 
So um, my tips are pretty straightforward, uh, but I think they will be really effective in helping people um, tackle this problem, especially in Texas. It's such a big state, and I have to imagine that can feel very overwhelming um, for a process that is very geography oriented. So, and, and I know from talking to folks that, you know, having a person that is, uh, their job is focused on mapping and data wrangling is not something that's like really widespread. Not every town or county has someone that is able to do that. So I recommend talking with your neighboring communities, counties, uh, government council districts, um, and find out who does have those people and can you share, can you work together? Um, because the more you can collaborate on this group project, really, um, the better off everyone is going to be. Um, and then with that in mind, um, kind of getting more specific, um, look at those challenge data. Um, now I know you cannot you can't visualize it specifically looking at the locations on a map because again, that requires the fabric. And if you have it, great, you can do that. But looking at patterns in that challenge data, you can highlight where there are lots of challenges happening in census blocks. And you can look at the providers that are having a lot of challenges upheld against them and look for those kinds of patterns. And you can identify areas that are very likely to have successful challenges um, against them in this bead process. Um, because remember, again, the map, the FCC map right now is very close to the version that Texas will be using. So keeping that in mind, um, the challenge data can be really helpful to narrow down your approach to the bead process, especially in, in your community. You know, you can look and see, is, is a, this house on a road has received a challenge is everyone else on the road still served or claimed to be served? Those places are most likely very challengeable, if so. Um, and so I, I often uh, like to highlight work done by Education Superhighway. They have been doing this thing called a desktop analysis where they are um, looking at specific locations. They have like a list of locations to go through and they are requesting service from every provider um, that is considered like a served provider on that location. And then if it is uh, declined, they take a screenshot and keep that as an evidence, a piece of evidence for their bead submissions. And they've submitted thousands of um, challenges and they're working in every state. So they're um, a really good example of, of how to um, make quick work, well, not quick, uh, but uh, kind of simplify this process um, and be effective. And then also I, you know, just want to remind people that the rebuttal period exists. You know, I, we talk a lot about the challenges themselves, but there's also the rebuttal period to participate in and to check in on what those providers are uh, challenging and claiming um, because the rebuttal period is kind of the last last option, last period where you can um, make sure that the locations that should be considered eligible are, are claimed as such. So, um, and just as an example, uh, I don't know why that image isn't showing up, but um, this was one address that I looked up. It was available and served in the FCC map. And um, when I requested service there, at and could not provide. So um, just that was that was my quick desktop analysis. So um, it's very easy to do. It's very achievable. You can train anybody that is comfortable with a computer how to do it. So um, and with that, I hope folks are feeling more confident about this process and understanding the differences between the challenges and, and how they might go about approaching bead um, in their community. And as promised, uh, some helpful resources. If you want to get more into detail about the bead process, um, we have our guide here. And um, finally, if you have any any other questions, feel free to reach out to me at christine at ilsr.org. And again, I'm very sorry for running over time. Thank you so much, Christine. This was really, really helpful. Great session.
Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that too, Christine and ILSR also. Like as someone who's trying to pay attention to this, like I'm still I'm learning things and, and different ways of approaching stuff. And so I think that's really helpful. And then um, I'm realizing like not knowing a lot of the names that are participating here and who's where in the state, it might at some point, like once Texas does announce their process, um, it might be nice to have some kind of forum to convene this again for like another second cut at like how to review. I don't know if that's on y'all's agenda or if a different or if Methodist or if some other part of this group could like could do that, but it might be good to have a conversation. I could see like a month from now or three weeks from now, like before a challenge happens. Yeah, that's a Thank good you. idea. That's great. And if you don't mind, like I know you're trying to wind down here. How, how did you know to look at that location in Nacogdoches? Like, was, was there uh, something that made you aware that that might be one that wasn't going to work? Or? Um, I was, I had had a meeting with one of the regional government councils, I think that's what they're called, uh, in, I think it was deep East Texas, maybe yeah, even somewhere right. on this call. Um, and so afterwards, I was just kind of like scrolling around in that area and happened to look in that town. And I was like, oh, AT&T seems to serve here. And so I, I probably clicked on a handful of locations before I found that one. So it didn't take long at all. That's a good indicator. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing or it's not very reassuring in terms of what they're doing, but you know, it's it, it's an easy process to go through, I guess is what I'm trying to convey. It's it's a good indicator. If you can find one that quickly, we should probably be doing some work and paying attention. So that's yeah. mm -hmm. awesome. Can I ask really quickly that since Mark's still on the line, if if he could um, clarify your question about um, the mechanism for keeping providers honest, um, do you mean will the state be keeping an eye on them to make sure they actually bill by the deadline, or do you mean, or or is there some other thing that you meant? Yeah, I think I think that's right. Just um, because I've seen that plan service mentioned with different states. I'm actually, I'm in Texas, but we're doing work in a couple of states. So I know that date is different months in other places. And just whether if a provider says they're going to have service there by November 30th, if um, if they don't have that done, <clears throat> do, does the local government or the nonprofit was paying attention um, need to flag that for the state or let them know for keeping them honest or We've got a pretty small broadband office. I'm not sure that I see it likely on their agenda. They're going to call and check on all those locations that are reported that way. And maybe maybe there's not a system. It's a very important question, though. All right. Um... There are no other questions. I think we can um, wrap it up. And thank you everyone so much for being here today and all your great questions.